Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Dermot Lynch. We're going to talk today about electrostatic discharge and what, why that's now a problem and what to do about it. Dermot, we've, we've been hearing about electrostatic discharge for a long time. Why is it becoming a bigger problem? The reason it's becoming a bigger problem today is that systems are becoming more integrated, number one, more devices on them. Uh, the, the overall challenge is voltages or, or breakdown voltages are becoming lower because as you go from 55 nanometers to 22 nanometers to 5 nanometers, at 5 nanometers you're basically running at less than a volt typically and so uh, the ESD voltages haven't changed and so if they haven't changed they're still hitting the same voltage across a far smaller transistor and across a far narrower wire so the current becomes a whole lot larger, larger for that particular width of wire. And so between the larger current that's being driven by the same voltages across smaller technologies, problems become bigger. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Dermot, what are we looking at? Uh, thanks for asking. So basically behind me here is a simple schematic, a traditional schematic of how people have been dealing with ESD for many, many years. And if you look at it, you've basically got internal circuitry and it's got to be protected um, from ESD events. And ESD events can come in on any pads, whether it's VDD pads, ground pads, signal pads, um, all accessible to the outside world, and any one of them can be hit. So th the goal here is how do you take that hit, that charge that's coming in, and how do you divert it away from the actual internal circuitry, the, the circuit that does the, all the functionality that you really want the chip to do. And so in order to do that, you tend to build low resistive paths away from all the, the IOs and all, all the power and ground. And you see that in here with clamps coming in as you come in. You want the current to come in and divert through the clamps and move on over. And there's typically secondary support of that nature, such as diodes as well. And that's all go aimed at taking the current coming in and, and diverting it out to the, the power and ground nets and, and trying to force it to go down through there to wherever the ground is on the device. This becomes more complicated as you start getting into heterogeneous designs and more domain-specific designs because each one is a little bit different, right? Correct, yes. Uh, so, so many of the failures you see today are, are from domain to domain because you, the grounds are connected through back-to-back -back tiles typically, but, but the paths are longer, so the resistance goes up, or in, in newer technologies these days, actually, what we're seeing is not just is it a resistance item, but because of charge device model type events, um, you get impedance or, or sorry inductance effects and the inductance itself basically now makes the impedance of that overall net a whole lot higher and that's pushing in, or enabling higher voltages to accumulate across any given device and causing a lot of failures. Usually people have thought about failures in the I.O. ring itself but what we're seeing more and more of is a lot of failures occurring within the core because of how the, the inductances are allowing current to flow. Another issue here is you've got very thin wires. The, the wires don't typically scale very well. So now you've got all this issue with uh, resistance capacitance inside the wires. What impact does that have? Well, you may have a lot of blown wires if you don't direct it away from the, from the wires correctly. And I mean, if you get a failure of that nature, you may not see it as a complete chip failure, but the functionality of the design um, will be lost or partial, partially lost. Um, and, and the last thing you want in a design is to have a chip out in a system and it malfunctioning partially because now it's extremely difficult to track that down and understand what part of the system is failing, is it a particular chip, what part of the chip is failing and so ESD has a tendency to, to have prolonged failures and also instant failures and it's, it's nicer, if it's going to fail it's nicer to see it instantaneously because it's easier to fix. Um, it's a failing in the field, the costs of correction go way, way up. Your tolerances are also much tighter than they were in the past too, right? So now any ESD can potentially cause a problem, whereas in the past it might have the system might have tolerated it? Correct. The, if you go back to the older technologies, if you were using 5-volt technology, um, most of the transistors there can survive for a, a, a short amount of time at 10 to 12 volts. Um, if you're looking at 1-volt technology today, if you're sh hitting that with more than 2, 2.5 volts, failure especially if it gets hit a few times, it's very likely. And so the probability of failure increases um, as technology shrink and, and the overall voltage of the devices and, and the currents that can be uh, pushed through wires um, 
both of those cases, failures are more likely. ESD has been accounted for for a while in uh, a lot of the EDA tools. But what happens now as we start getting into these more domain-specific designs that are different and also going into 3D? So, so a couple of different items are occurring. Is within, within the IC domain, there's been two well-defined tests, one called HBM for human body model and the other one CDM for charge device model. Um, human body model is the standard test that most people have been using um, to val verify, and they've been using um, tools such as Herc style tools for doing static checks and, and they work very well. Um, they, they show you whether you've got uh, low resistive paths and that's good for a lot of HBMs. So you still see failures on some HBM tests but the, the, as you go down to smaller technologies the charge device model has become a bigger and bigger problem and simulating that is a very difficult task. Um, and the checkers themselves don't really cover any of those capabilities. And so that means that more and more of the problems you're seeing in devices are coming because of CDM issues. 3D adds a whole different challenge here because now you have multiple layers. Does the, what gets discharged in one layer affect what's below it or can it? So depending on the architecture of it, but assuming there's V has gone from layer one to layer two or layer three, um, adding, especially as you're putting a, a new device down on top of whatever's already there. Now what in essence you're doing is you've got a potentially charged device with current that can flow down through all the layers below it. That poses a problem as to where's the problem, where, where's the violations, if viol violations occur, where are they in layer one, in layer two, um, and, and if you're stacking a lot of devices it becomes very complicated. And handling this type of problem is going to be a must-have as these 3D devices become more common. There's also a lot of new materials that are coming into these devices as well. You think about some of the dielectrics, they're completely different. They're also thinner than they were in the past. We're also dealing with potentially some power electronics that are coming into some of the packages. How does that all affect the ESD? So the power electronics can actually help it because typically power transistors are large transistors that can actually act as a, an ESD device to, to, to be a, a, a channel for the current to get away. The, the overall impact of all the other new materials uh, really depends on how they impact the overall capacitances and the overall inductances um, because what you're really looking at is still a, 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 an LRC type circuit and what's the structure of that LRC circuit and wh where, where are you going to be able to conduct based on all the structure and, and whatever the uh, permittivities and dielectric con constants of the devices are. You also have signal path which needs to be uh kept separate from whatever charge is running through here, right? So now you have to think in, in multiple terms here. Yes, so, so as we had spoken before, the, the whole reason for trying to make this a very low resistive path for the ESD is that you're protecting the signal paths. Um, because in essence, as, as the current comes gushing in here, you want to be able to maneuver it, maneuver it out um, and make it go to the lowest resistive path, which is what you're trying to design for ESD. In, in the case of CDM, um, you have charge distributed across the whole device, whether it's, it might be in the substrate or the upper layers. And, and in that case, uh, it's not always quite as simple to do, but, but the goal again there is get it to the larger power and ground nets as soon as possible. If you do get uh, some interaction between the two of them, what's the impact in terms of the signal, assuming that this whole system doesn't crash? So if the signal net is actually getting hit, the probability, especially in newer technologies, the probability is going to be that you're going to have a failure. Um, we mentioned before uh, narrower wires, we mentioned smaller voltages that cause failures. Um, if you're getting a portion of this large current flowing through there, the probability is high that either the voltage across the, the gate drain, gate source, or the, or the, the uh, thickness of the wire will be not enough to stand it. So if you have to think about this in really macro terms, really what you're doing is putting in what's the equivalent of uh, lightning rods all the way through this design, right? Fundamentally. I mean, and, and not just the chip, but even the system. Because if you look at a system, you'll see uh, diodes, and you'll see, see a whole variety of devices to protect the, the board itself. And, and then on the chip itself, you've got ESD clamps, ESD diodes, a, a wide range of other uh, items, just, as you say, diverting everything away by lightning rods. How much of this can be simulated during design? So, so there's different levels at which you can go. Um, even from a schematic level, the PERC tools, which I mentioned earlier, can start doing netlist checks. 
Um, but in there, you're fundamentally looking to make sure, do I have enough ESD devices in? Are they placed in the right locations? Is the resistance low enough of, of what I can tell through those devices? As you move into layout, and now you, you start to move in because you can put in a, a lot of ESD devices, clamps and diodes, but they tend to be large devices, so take up a lot, a lot of die area. So you'd ideally like to reduce them to a min minimal number. This is where being able to simulate really becomes beneficial. And in the past, you also had a lot more margin built into these designs. Now you have uh, much less margin. It's, it's constrained in every different direction. Do use cases based upon that potentially alter ESD protection and things like that as you're using the chip? The requirement is fundamentally the same. The, the, the problem is to make sure that the voltages you know, or currents getting to the cores uh, are very limited. Um, a a well-designed ESD network will ensure all the current flows through it, or, or the, the vast, vast majority, so that it will protect the devices through that. And, and that's, as, as you start designing your ESD network, that's the goal. It's only in the ESD network that a, an ESD strike should have current flowing. But you do have aging issues that you didn't previously have, uh, or accelerated aging in some areas, right? Yes. That, that will, over time, have the possibility of making failure to occur quicker. Sometimes, uh, how do you design for that at the moment? Um, you'd have to sort of go and look at the aging of the ESD uh, devices themselves and, and model appropriately. Dermot Lynch, thanks for a great explanation. Ah, thank you very much.